excuse me, but doesn't anybody know this is against the law? So is dressing up a chicken and calling it your wife. <laughs> Why does he keep calling me a chicken? Now, Marcy, don't get your feathers ruffled. <laughs> Let's rock. Thanks, Dad. Can I get a whoop No man presents. Live from the Nudie Bar, the Married with Children Podcast. And here are your hosts, Jerry, Justin, and Al. All right, this is a true honor for us all. I'd like to welcome the beautiful, the talented, the legendary. Yes, she played a legendary character in one of our favorite, in our favorite sitcom of all time. Here is Marcy Rhodes and or Darcy, Amanda Burse. Amanda, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. It was nice to meet you at the convention. What was that, about last month, I think? Yeah, it was it was so great. Uh, I walked up to you and, you know, I just had to, you know, nerd out and tell you about the show. Like, I was like, wow, she's going to be there. And now we're doing this Married with Children podcast. I was like, this is amazing. And uh, I just went up to you and showed you some of the episodes. And you were like, oh, so uh, what do you want? You want me to come on or something? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> sure. Why not? I love talking about Married with Children. Yeah. It's and so do we. It's been such a great time. We have just uh, today we we released our twenty second show. Um, it was the Razor's Edge, <laughs> where you wanted Steve to shave his beard. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> yes. And I I think I used uh, I withheld something important to him in order to get him to do that. Right? Yeah. He he stood strong for a while, but not even <laughs> Al's mom that, keep you know, him away. That has the most classic, one of the most classic uh, pieces of tape on the show, which is when Al pulls out the Polaroid to uh, show Steve a picture of his mother-in-law. And we used to use that, I think, almost every uh, reel that we built that the audience, the live audience, would see before we'd start taping the show. What That piece of, uh, that, that scene was on it. It's just so classic. Guys, did I not point that out and say this is the greatest thing on television period al describing his mother-in-law yeah you like, did. how how weird is that <laughs> this is so crazy well great minds great married with children minds think alike i guess it really it was such a funny bit and um and uh, you could tell both the guys really enjoyed doing it that was early <laughs> on in the life of the show crazy you know it's funny we started this show 30 years after the show premiered like almost on the dot like i think it was april something and we started in january exactly 30 years later and the one thing that keeps occurring to us is wait they said this in 1987 because you know now everything is so oh oh, you can't do that can't offend people can't do that and you know we've all heard of you know all the family and stuff like that but like it's just different because like uh it's prime time it's fox and you guys are still getting away with crazy stuff so we wondered, like, how crazy did it get that didn't make it? Like, were there any scripts where even, like, you said, guys, I'm not doing this. You got to be cool. Well, you know, it's our job as the actors to to bring what they've written to life. There were some moments that were, uh, in my in my <laughs> mindset, uh, a, a, little, uh, a little on the distasteful side. But it was a universally distasteful show. And uh, yeah. universally mean spirited, so it wasn't just an attack on one particular group of people or person. You know, Al, it was Al against the world. But the reason, and you're absolutely right, it would probably not get made today unless it was, you know, through a web series or um, uh, some other creative fashion. The reason it made it on the air was because this was the very beginning of the Fox Network. And this show is not going to sell to ABC, NBC, or CBS. 
which were playing, you know, the real lovey-dovey families at the time. And this was written, a working title, as uh, the anti-Cosby show. (laughs) And it was. And so the fact that we got on the Fox Network was a blessing because there wasn't anything else on the Fox Network. So (laughs) we found a time slot. And this was not uh, the powers that be over there at Fox, which was Barry Diller at the time was running the studio. This was not his favorite show, nor was it his, the type of show he wanted to, uh, represent this, this fourth network, which people said could never happen. Um, and yet this was the show that stuck and, and anchored the launch of, uh, what they originally called FBC that we now know as Fox. Yeah, I mean, it is like what happened, the way that all took place, like, you know, the whole thing about the lady from Wisconsin writing the letter, like when that happened, did it double the ratings or whatever? Like it became like the biggest like primetime sitcom on earth at that point, right? Well, I don't know the specific stats. What we do know is that people were still not finding their Fox channel. Now, mind you, it was just syndicated. It was on you know, these obscure channel 23, 42, 37 kind of things on local stations. This was when there were three channels that ran reruns during the summer. So we picked up audience in the summertime because they were sick of seeing their regular shows two or three times already in reruns. And, but we also, this woman with her campaign to pull advertising brought so much attention to the show. People were were, uh, curious And so they did tune in. Yeah, there was a a build on the audience from that point. I don't know if it's that one inciting incident, but it certainly didn't hurt. And we were all very grateful. What season was that? Do you remember by any chance? 1990, which would be season. um, Well, you know what? what? You guys may know better. There was a show, I think, the one where they're in the lingerie uh, yeah, it was uh, the lingerie shop episode. Yes, and I think, you know, that might have been season two, three, something like that. It was pretty early on. And, uh, you know, of course, we all said, and everybody really's attitude towards towards her was just turn the channel or, or, or turn the television off. But I think <laughs> all in all, we lost maybe one advertiser but we had huge um success with advertisers especially budweiser um uh from whom you know from which bud is named and um (laughs) and 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 also because they could advertise to men and men typically did not watch half hour scripted television and married with children found very much uh that audience you, you're for your proof. Your your second, third generation proof of that. Yeah, no, I believe it or not, I watched it right when I was uh, 11 years old. So it was 1991. I was 11. So, yeah, I I got to see a lot of it in first run. You turned out okay though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I'm doing a married children podcast. I'm doing great. <laughs> and it, we found it strange that it seems that season. If you look at the air dates, um. Season one and two both took place in 1987. Like, was it, we were thinking it was just so successful and people loved it so much that they said you have to immediately crank more out because you only did 13 episodes for season one. Well, again, and you know, the show made fun of Fox while we were on it because Fox was truly finding its way. And, you know, this is a very different age in the history of television. We made the pilot in 1986. In a very traditional fashion, meaning the the network, the studio, which was Columbia Pictures Television at the time, actually was em- Embassy, which was Norman Lear's studio. Um, and that ended with Married with Children and was um, sort of absorbed by Columbia Pictures Television, which then became what we now know as Sony. So you have a studio as well as a network, and they get to weigh in. So we made the pilot. Even though we felt very strongly about it and we're pretty confident, you still have to wait for the pickup, which we received. And so we went back into production. That was December of 86. We went back into production immediately uh, at, the, at the start of 87. And then we did launch April 5th of that year. And so the first order, which is often the case, is a 13-episode order. 
usually what happens in back then in traditional television is you get a back nine pickup because it used to be a standard 22 episode order for any half hour series. But Fox started breaking rules. I mean, and that it was just the beginning of what is now blown up in the digital age of the, the shift in broadcast television. And so, you know, most shows premiered in the fall. That was the, and they still have a bit of that tradition with the, the May upfront ad um, convention where all the networks make their announcements for the fall schedule. But Fox being this upstart could do whatever they wanted. And so they did. So we got on the air and we just did a, a first 13 order. Here's the deal about that. You have to write the script. And it takes time. And so they needed the downtime. We got right into production. We got right on the air uh, pretty quickly. Um, but then we needed the downtime to, uh, to create more scripts for upcoming seasons. But again, we were just picked up pretty much season by season for a while there because the, the network was such a fledgling um, situation that – you know, we don't, and little by little shows were starting to stick. I mean, 21 Jump Street was a pretty successful show. It was just outside of primetime, which was interesting on Sunday nights from seven to eight. But the sitcoms and the shows that they put around us were not, didn't have real staying power. Tracy Ullman was a terrific show, but I don't think she ran more than a couple of seasons, two or three. Yeah, and in season two, y'all started doing uh, much bigger episodes. You started doing two-parters. We recently covered the two-parter, uh, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, which is one of my favorite Steve Marcy episodes because I'm a huge Steve fan. Um, and <laughs> so we noticed, am I. Yeah, I, I would <laughs> hope so. Um, and we noticed something during uh, your dance with Zorro that uh, yeah. your ring didn't make it down his pants. It, it clearly fell onto the floor and obviously back then you really probably wouldn't pay attention did anyone on the set even notice that you know what it's been so long i don't i don't recall but um and i don't even recall that that happened uh, <laughs> really wow. yeah so um but see leave it to your keen eyes and especially yeah. <laughs> the the level of fandom that that you all are operating from, you know, you, you look at things like that because you really, you, you go through things, dissect them, um, enjoy them, find the bloopers, find the mistakes, that sort of thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if you guys were the ones to make that discovery. <laughs> Not to mention picture quality itself has come a long way and it's probably easier to notice you know, on a TV now. I, 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 you dropped out. I think you said picture quality now. Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody knew what resolution was. <laughs> Lines of resolution, you know what I mean? It was just, it was digibeta. It was shot on. It was kind of lit. It, it, it was not exactly uh, a high definition by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. No. And we're, we're, di we're dying to get this, to have Mills Creek release this on Blu-ray, so... We could see it in in all of its glory, but I don't know. They're dragging their feet or something. So, hopefully that happens. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually a good question. Uh, on our show, we talk about wanting a Blu-ray of this, um, and a lot of us just picked up the Mill Creek box set that came out uh, not too long ago. Do y'all get any royalties or residuals from new releases of the show, uh, like on Blu-ray or DVD? Um. I imagine that we do, you know, again, uh, the, the, the show has been stripped so many times into syndication and with that our foreign markets and ancillary markets, like you're talking about with the uh, DVD and so forth. And everybody's particular deal on the show was negotiated separate and apart from one another. So what one, one, one person has, in front of or behind the camera doesn't necessarily hold true for everyone. But when something, a big fell swoop, something like that would occur, I imagine that there is going to be some residual payment that comes floating down from the wind. And that's really the way it happens. And the show has never left the air in 30 years. And 
Um, wow. It was certainly a great run of the show. Now, most people think, you know, I've, I've got more money than, than creation. But, you know, again, we were a syndicated network. And I'll just offer you a little explanation about that. A show at the time that was a huge success was Cheers on NBC. And, um, and say, Ted Danson would have a, a pretty healthy salary. Well, the first time uh, an episode that was shot reruns, so the first time there is a, a re-showing, he gets, or the, uh, uh, an actor of that caliber w- would get a um, a healthy percentage of their original salary. So, hmm. and I I've heard numbers such as seventy five percent of the original week salary, which you know is a lot. What? And wow. and, then, and then it would go down from there, little by little by little. The more it's stripped into syndication, the more uh, different. Um, facilities, local stations purchase it, and um, it would go down from there. On Married with Children, because we were not a network when we started, we were a syndicated network, the standard rerun rate, no matter what, <laughs> you how you were in front of the camera, I think started at about $373. Wow. And then every time it was aired, it went down from there. Now, that's kind of broad strokes, but that lets you know that until there were a certain amount of hours of programming for Fox, which I think was three to four nights of programming of primetime, did it become, quote unquote, a, a, a network. There was no retroactive um, monies applied to that. Listen, we all had a good run on that show. We had 10 years. We had a lot of fun, a lot of the time. It gave me my second career. But this is not as much the cash cow that other shows at that time um, were. Hmm. However, it's 30 years later. You know, the show is played all over the world and then some. And back again, and like you say, there are different markets, the DVD market, the Blu-ray market, that that would create, you know, a lump sum of, of monies that would then get distributed. Um, but that distribution um, is now very particular to each person's involvement on the show. Huh. That's really interesting. I've always wondered how yes, I teach, that whole thing uh, works. I teach film and television now. Can you tell? Me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it definitely sounds like it. <laughs> well, but it's also because Mary with Children, you know, not just from a fan enjoyment, entertainment value or point and laugh at, uh, really made history in, in the course of yeah. television history. So, um, yeah, I appreciate being able to talk with you guys about it. Yeah. One thing that strikes us, you know, you talk about making history. One of the things is how amazing you all portrayed your characters. I mean, there is not a weak link here and it's really astounding. And one of the things that struck us in examining the show now is that season two is the one where you all really figured out who you were. So that was one thing that we thought was amazing that it all happened in such a short time. Like you didn't even have, you didn't even have that time off to think about it. Like what you're going to do when you come back, what is, how am I going to add a new dimension to Marcy, this and that, like you started like just to, you know, to give broad strokes of everybody, like Al was more of like the grumpy dad who was just sarcastic, you know, and Bud was totally one dimensional, just the annoying brother, mm-hmm. who, you know, sometimes this and that. And you were like, you were trying, like they were portraying you as like sort of, a, you know, uptight, nerdy, mousy kind of, you know, very proper neighbor. And then by season two, <laughs> like for someone who's so nerdy, Marcy really is a sexual <laughs> person and and even in season one, like you, you hinted on something that you really became like when, uh, you would, you would, you created this thing with your character where you decided that, uh, you're going to stare off into blankness and just like <laughs> talk about things that you're thinking in your head. You're sort of talking to 
no one. You're sort of talking to the people in the room, like when you describe, like, I, and then we'll take little fish hooks and and then we'll we'll drag their, you know, when they broke into your house, and then you're talking about how you loved Elvis Presley, and you get into this whole thing, like that was my first orgasm on on national television was the Elvis Presley one. I think I think Marcy went on to have two or three more or two or three in total in the in the show. But you're right; it it has everything though to do with the writing. And I'm a firm believer, and I've been in the business for a very, very long time, that if if it's not on the page, if the words are not the right way in the script, then no matter how many bells or whistles or how much a performer is, is has talent and training, it, it won't work. So right. the, the show begins and ends on the page. And with that was the definition of each character. So they found our voices as well. Uh, you're right. We were an inventive bunch of actors, um, and we um, we had fun trying out things, and and there was a safety in that. And so we, it all did kind of gel early on. And I was very disappointed when David decided to leave the show because I loved working with him, and he's a very talented guy. But also, I learned a lot from David. Uh, and, uh, so I enjoyed the time we had together, but I was sad to see him go. But then even with Ted coming into the show, we were, we were a pretty well running machine by that time, but it was nice to have a whole new energy come in and give us a shot in the arm and, and go a different direction. And I think they found a lot of, a lot of humor by doing that, just by virtue of the fact that. You know, they switched gears with the husbands. I miss Steve. Steve, Steve is 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 my all time favorite character on the show. I I love. He's the one I relate to the most because I'm not which I'm not like your typical masculine guy. And on the show, I most of the times more relate to him. And we always love when him and Al get together and they have their like brotherhood. And then we also love it when. He's Al's trying to get him not to do something you want him to do, and he can't help it. He just he loves you so much that he ends up doing it, uh, and it's a big play in the show. How 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 much was David actually like Steve, or was it a completely different aspect of him? Well, um, David Garrison was the only actor who was written for. Because he had done another series with Ron Levitt and Michael Moy, the creative producers, the creators of Married with Children. They had done a, a short-lived series called It's Your Move, and Jason Bateman starred in that as a very young kid uh, opposite David Garrison. So Ron and Michael were fans of David, and they wrote the part of Steve Rhodes with him in mind. And um, so they already and they're, they were such talented, talented creators and writers. And so they had his voice. And I, I think it's wonderful the way you just put that. And I, too, I'm a huge fan of David Garrison. And I've seen him um, in many of his theatrical successes because he's a real Broadway guy. And he has uh, just worked nonstop since he left Mary with children. He was on Broadway before Mary with children, but that really is his passion is, is legitimate theater. And he, you know, he's a, a New York guy. Well, you want to hear what's crazy about that? It just shows how tuned in we are to this because on our season one wrap up show, I, it's funny because we're still talking about the same thing that I'm referring to. Uh, when we were talking about like the characters and if they found their character yet, what I said was, the only person who seems to have truly found his character right off the bat is Steve. Yeah, because his <laughs> voice was the strongest. Well, you're, you know, your instinct is right. So you pat yourself on the back again. Um, <laughs> but it's true because the character was, was written for him. And I think it's a lovely, um, uh, was it Jerry who was talking about Steve? Is it Jerry? You're yep, the big I'm Steve the, fan. I'm okay. the big Steve so, fan. Uh, Okay, well, and I think it's a really lovely um, conflict that David Garrison was able to embody the one between wanting a guy bud 
and wanting to please his wife, not only to not get in trouble, but because he genuinely cares her, cares for her and, um, and, and loves her. And so, you know, he was really able to, to give us that as an audience, uh, that it wasn't just, um, an unfounded decision that you could really see the push pull of that character and that we are more than one dimension. Now, I think as the show went on year after year, we became more, uh, less dimensional. Uh, I tell people we became the Simpsons, we became the cartoon, and then they took a, a lot of our storylines. But, you know, by the end of the show, it was pretty silly stuff. We were throwing those, those bodies off roofs and, you know, the, oh, God. it was, and, you know, the character of Al Bunny was also conceived with the idea of Wiley Coyote from the Roadrunner cartoon series. <laughs> and so when Wiley Coyote would have that big Acme anvil fall on his head and then the next scene he'd have a, a Band-Aid across his forehead, you know, an adhesive strip, that's sort of the way we were treating the reality as the, as the seasons wore on. But initially there was more complexity. And um, and that's that's also because there was more written for just the four adults on the show. And Christina and David, who who replaced the original pilot uh, children on the show, grew to be such an integral and an important part. Yeah. You know, uh, that's why I enjoy talking with you about it. I have genuinely um, strong and um, fond memories uh and association with that time in my life so ah it was amazing like, we can only imagine what you your whole like i wish we just had like hours of you know behind the scenes like whatever was going on there and like one of the biggest behind the scenes you know going back to steve is w what kind of conversation did you have with him like when he came to you guys it goes hey listen uh you know it's been great guys it's actually the show's never been better but I'd like to go back to stage. Like, were you all like, dude, please don't do this. You don't understand. Well, it wasn't born necessarily out of that. Yes, there's truth. And this isn't my story to tell. This is more David's story to tell. But he he's not an L.A. guy. He really is a New Yorker. And he didn't love living in Los Angeles, number one, which is where the show was filmed. And, you know, eight eight months out of the year, he, he needed to be there. So that did play a part of it. There were a number of different things. Um, elements that that contributed to his decision. Um, one of which was, yeah, he really does love uh, the stage, and and uh, and he gets to exercise his craft and his abilities in a completely different way than playing one character all the time on one show. Um, but there are other elements there too, and perhaps it'll it'll come out in a book someday. Um, but there was there was a lot that went on behind the scenes, and uh, a lot of people know certain aspects of it. But ten years is a long time for any group of people to spend that sort of constancy um, together, both in front of and behind the camera. So you're going to have you know some highs, you're going to have some some plateau, and you're going to have some some lows. And so Married with Children was no exception, uh, the production as a whole, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I know, like, you know, you guys didn't exactly think the high point uh, was around anymore once the two creators left and stuff. And it was like, oh, okay, you know, we're still into this. We still love doing it. But it's it's odd. It's a little different. And, you know, one of the big aspects were, uh, you know, bringing that kid, the infamous seven in the show, like, yeah, that's when we jumped the shark. That's that definitely <laughs> that seventh season. It was also at a time because, you know, our, our parents, basically the co-creators, and we were lucky also to a sidebar is oftentimes creative producers do not stay with the show. They'll create a show and they'll they'll run it if their season. They'll they'll be the showrunners of the show or or it's one person or, or a writing team for a few years, but not for a, a a, a really long necessary uh, run of the show, um, especially back then. Um, things are a little different. There are exceptions like I think Will and Grace and, you know, the Charles Brothers of Cheers and so forth. But we were lucky to have Ron and Michael for as long as we did as a writing team. But they divorced as writers. Right. 
So mommy and daddy, daddy and daddy broke up. And so <laughs> when that happens, you know, it does, things do shift. And part of that shift was season seven. And it was, anytime you bring in a kid, you know, it's, uh, it's not a good sign. And we had already weathered the storm of, uh, of Steve leaving, meaning Marcy being single for, for a period of time, which just did not work. And when they started to kind of play around with the bud, Marcy, um, hooked up. Oh on yeah. Number not... cuckoo, cuckoo, Mrs. Robinson. Yeah, that's exactly where I said that was one of those times where I spoke up and went, we're not going to do that. We're not going there. <laughs> and they really, they weren't, they really weren't, you know, it was complete. Um, it was illegal, not, <laughs> yeah, right. not, not, to, not to mention other things, but, um, then what it did shift again when, um, uh, Ron left and he was the, the, the producer that was there for season seven and then Michael came back for season eight and nine, something like that. I may have, my, you know, it's Fox. I may have my numbers wrong. Um, but I was not of the school of um, that the show could not continue without them. Um, and I have since worked with a number of the people who were involved in that last season of production of Married with Children. And they're very talented writer producers. There were other personalities on the set that were uh, resistant to that kind of change. And um, because I was so involved as a director on the show, I had a different perspective. So, of course, we miss Ron and Michael, and um, and there's nothing like those, those early years uh, when it was a little more blissful uh, experience. And we were still sort of in shock of the, oh, my gosh the show keeps going. Wow. Wow. There are people watching the show, you know, and really being grateful. And I don't know that we ever lost that gratitude. Um, I certainly didn't, but you know, things change over time. I, I just saw a season 11 recently. Cause I'm trying to stay away from the ones we're reviewing. Like if I want to watch the show just to enjoy it, I'm staying away from things we'll get to, you know, so it's sort of fresh to me when we get to it. So I just zipped through season 11 recently, and that is a really, really strong season. It's almost uh, hard to believe that they canceled the show, you know, because... Uh... Well, that was the season where if you were a fly wall, you would understand. Oh, okay. Because the dynamics and the whole, um, the whole regimen of the show shifted. And um, those who were in a position of power really took advantage of it. And it became a very difficult day-to-day -day, uh, process. Whereas, you know, it didn't have to be. It was a shame. And, you know, people comment to me all the time, we wish we had known you were going off the air, you guys should have gotten a good finale, blah, blah, blah. Because then years after that, they, you know, networks knew how to cash in and they would build a series ending to a finale, but they just let this one go because of the difficulty that um, just was prevalent throughout the entire last season of the show. Wow. Yeah. That's so, that's so sad. And you know, I, <laughs> I'm like nervous to ask you this one, but uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, this weird thing that nobody really knows is true, but it's floating around like rumors online and stuff. Uh, is it true that you and Ed O'Neill would clash a lot? Like you guys actually did not get along off screen very much? Well, the last season, like I said, was, was very difficult. Ed and I were very good friends when we first started the show and we enjoyed a lot of time working together by the end of the run of the show. Um, that was not the case. Right. So, um, you know, I don't know specifics to the rumors there were confrontations a lot of it had to do stem from the fact that because i had been directing the the show i think by that time for five seasons i mean i'd done multitudes of episodes um that i had a different um uh task to perform and uh, not not just as an actor. And so that put me in a different position. I'm also um, uh, a very vocal person. And if something, um, I'm not passive aggressive. I wouldn't say that I'm aggressive, but I will stand up for myself and I will stand up for other people. 
And so sometimes in in the throes of that, conflict would arise. But um, it's unfortunate because, and I said it at the time, it didn't have to be this way, but it was. Yeah. And, and you, sa yeah. Um, you said you got a second career as a director through Mary with Children, and you directed around uh, like 30 episodes of Mary with Children, 10 episodes of like Dharma and Greg. You even did like five episodes of Reba and five episodes of uh, the Jamie Foxx show. So you really did like get some, some good jobs in directing uh, for TV shows. But out of like the 30 episodes you directed for Married with Children, do you have any standout ones that you just really enjoyed uh, as the job of director making? Okay, a couple of things. Yeah, they gave me my second career. I've been directing episodic television for over 25 years now, and I've directed over 100 of different episodes of television. So various shows, sometimes just a one-stop uh, sometimes, as you listed, I stayed with the show for, for several episodes, um, and I continued to, to do that. But um, Mary with Children, I guess the very first episode I directed was significant because it was my very first episode, and I had such um, strong support across the board, especially from the cast, who were really in my corner to to, for me to succeed and, and for me to make this um, leap. A lot of actors do try their hand at directing. It's a natural sort of transition or progression to make. We have a shared vocabulary and understanding of what it means to be an actor as a director. And, um, you know, we speak the same language, but it is a technical job as well. So not all actors stay with it because of that Um that aspect or they don't really embrace it. I enjoyed all of it and, and continue to, I got to work a lot with Christina, um, shows that would feature her. Um, and I got to, they knew that we had, we worked well together. Um, and so several of those, I remember one where she was a waitress. She had a job as a waitress. Oh, that was one of the best episodes. Well, she, Mary with Children loved the device of montage, which is actually in many ways a little bit of a cheat way to write because you can tell the story, you can move the narrative forward without having to script dialogue, and you just really create a series of pictures and, and, um, and have fun with the visual. And um, I think one episode I directed, the one where Kelly – was a, a game show in place of Al and he would put information in her head. But uh, if she got new information in her head, something came out. I think in that show alone, we did three separate montage sequences, but yeah. the waitress show um, uh, was particularly fun. And Christina is just so alive. She is just so very talented and so comedically talented that it was always fun to to get to work more with her wow yeah <laughs> that's just so amazing like all the episodes you mentioned are just great and you did a great job on everything it's 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 pretty amazing you know um yeah even you know i don't want to even talk like uh season seven was some kind of horrible thing and the show was never the same because you know the weird thing about it yeah sure it you obviously lost the footing or lost something or added too much or try to make up for something that wasn't even lacking. Like sometimes when people see ratings dip or whatever, they try to look for an answer and it's not necessarily the content. So maybe that's all that happened, you know, with adding that kid to the show. But, you know, it's such an, an infamous story even. Like, did you have to explain to this kid? Like, did you go, uh, hey, little guy, uh, come here for a minute. So, yeah. People really don't like you that much. We're going to have to make believe this never happened. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think you're right. I think there was still a lot of good in season seven. I don't think it was the best creative choice to to bring the kid on. I don't think he was the best creative choice casting-wise. Um, we didn't have a whole lot to do with them because kids on the set have to be pulled from the set all the time for their education. So it's, there's not a lot of hanging around the way there is with the other adult actors. So it also would not have been our place. It wasn't our place to have that discussion. And again, there are powers that be, meaning there are a lot of different people that get to weigh in 
um, from the trickle down network studio executive producers and so on uh, to make that determination. We knew it didn't right. really gel. We knew he particularly, and no offense, he's just a young guy, a young little guy. You know, it just wasn't the right vibe. And, um, but I agree. It wasn't anything that we stumbled over that we couldn't get up and dust off and keep going. No. And you did. Yeah. Yeah. Three or three or four more years, I think. Yeah. Exactly. Mm hmm. When, uh, when Steve returned for those those episodes like the one where he's hiding an egg the one where he's a pirate the one where he's a limo driver or that like that weird radio station episode or whatever <laughs> trying to launch a spinoff those manufactured <laughs> silly spinoffs that they tried to do that one was with carrie russell who you know went on to have a huge career the first one they tried to do a spinoff of was with um matt leblanc Right. Uh, and uh, again, it, you know, when you try to manufacture and invent characters to then spin off a show that it doesn't make any sense, it, 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 uh, obviously they're epic fails. Um, I'm sorry, what were you asking? I loved it when David came back. Absolutely. It was... Yeah, like what was your favorite episode or, or like how great was the reunion when you got to all hug each other and be like, wow, man, it's, we miss you so much. And, and then you got to – the first one with the egg and you got to have the clash and like the battle, like he's, he's going to reclaim you and Jefferson's the new pretty boy in town. Like that couldn't have been any better, man. Like, I like, agree. Is that your favorite? Well, I mean, it was great because it was, the, again, it was the first time he came back and it was just so funny anyway, that they wrote that he left me to become a park ranger, which is, yeah, right. you know, and again, they pulled from all of our personal lives. They pull elements from all of our lives um, to, to bring out in different ways. And David for being this very um, refined New York city uh, guy, he's, he's very nature centric and he took uh, several of us on a trip uh, in the, I think it was after the first 13 episodes, we took a break and we all went river rafting for a week together. And, you know, he was a guide. He, he, so he, there was this element of David Garrison that they then twisted into the park ranger. So, you know, they find a way to, to turn things, uh, on its ear. And, um, and I just love that. So when he came back as the ranger, and with the egg and the storyline was was good fun, but it was great too. And I have um, one of those photos that I share with people is is me standing between Ted and and David Jefferson and Steve um, uh. during that episode. I loved the I thought the car wash episode was a great episode, which is the one where David came back to be the limo driver. I thought Ed O'Neill <laughs> did the most outrageous. I, it just made me laugh the whole time it was being done to watch him go through it was a silent movie to watch him go through the car wash and yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a person not a car um and again i like the storyline i like the mislead uh that gave david something fun to play in terms of showing out for marcy and marcy being a little um pulled into it suckered into it uh, it was always great. And then the Pirate King episode, again, David Garrison's a big musical comedy performer, uh, including Pirates of uh, Penzance, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, which is sort of way old school uh, musical theater. And so they, the, the writers, producers took that and ran with it. And that's how that episode came about. And I think if David was to say, if I could speak for him, he had a blast doing that one. Oh yeah. Yep. And oh, I was the I cabin boy girl. Steve. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cabin boy girl. Uh-huh. Again, so, from real life. So there you go. So in 1993 you came out as a lesbian and it was it was big news because you were one of the first primetime actresses to come out and you had your whole cast supporting you and everything like that. Was that scary to do even with the you know the show that you're on pushes the boundary and tackles uh, jokes that no one else would touch and right. even jokes that were about being lesbian. How right. was it coming out for you? Well, you know, I had been living my life out. And so th that was the professional move. And so everybody knew that I was gay 
on the set. I mean, it, it wasn't a big secret or anything. Um, and the reason I came out publicly slash professionally was because it was the the time that my child was being born and the tabloid press was um, having a field day sort of putting a, a real negative spin, as they do, on things. And that's when I just made the decision that there's nothing negative about me, my life, the choices, who I am, my child. All of those things are are are, are things that deserve respect and integrity. Uh, and so that's when I just decided to tell the story my way. And, yes, everybody was supportive. I didn't realize that there was more trickle down until that each Hollywood story that was made that like four or five hour long Idru Hollywood story. And they, they actually, you know, did a segment around it. And I was like, Oh, I didn't realize, uh, because they took care of me. I mean, they didn't, they, they shielded me from, from that. Um, I was the first person on primetime television, male or female to come out of the closet and um and i didn't do it uh everybody who is in the lgbtq community makes the choices that they make for themselves in their own personal lives at their own time in their own time and it was just the right time for me well we are we are super proud of you and Thank you. and so glad that your cast backed you and you were able to do it and not get at like I, i'm proud of you for doing it for you most of all thank you like that's well it uh, was an important that's great. yeah and it was uh thank you i appreciate that and it is a very um full and rich experience to be able to bring all of who you are to any situation and mm -hmm. um you know as a gay person in the entertainment industry where i was cast playing ardently heterosexual women uh you know i would have to sort of fragment a little bit of my own life leave it leave it at the doorstep um, and and not really be able to fully bring all of myself to to my work. And married with children, I could. They understood me to be who I was as Amanda, but they also wrote a wonderful character for me to portray. And you know, I know a lot of women like Marcy, and I love Marcy. She's she's dear to me. Um, but that they saw me as a competent enough actress that. It, it it didn't matter. Now, was I out of the closet and did I walk into the office and auditions with a rainbow flag? No, I did not. <laughs> I did not. I showed up there with with a character and, and choices that I made uh, to try and, and bring life and comedy to what they'd written. And that's how that came about. But, you know, we all grow and evolve and hopefully for the better. And um, and it it was it was a, a rich experience to also feel the support or that it was a non-issue. It's more that it was just a non-issue. Mm, right. yeah. Not like it was pointed at. It certainly wasn't the, the wave that, that Ellen DeGeneres wrote a couple of years later. And, uh, and, you know, and that was a profound and, and mighty experience. And she's had a career to sense to, to, uh, to, to demonstrate that, but, you know, we just all make the, choices in our lives to do things when we do them for the reasons that we have. Sometimes those reasons are made public and sometimes, you know, they're held privately. Yeah. Well, this has been such an amazing experience that uh, you're just everything I hoped you would be such a great person. I knew that when I met you and Aww. this has been just the best. And thank you so much. Like this show means so much to us and to the point where we made a podcast about it and to have you come on here is just amazing and can't thank you enough. And I guess in, in wrapping it up, I mean, the only last thing obviously that, you know, we're going to ask you <laughs> is anything about these reunion rumors. I know it's not, nothing is even probably really in motion, but like, is there any way that that could ever happen? Do you think? I, I can share what I've heard, and that was that they were looking to reimagine, uh, reboot the show with David Faustino um, as the lead because he's now the age or around the age that um, Al was. Ed was when, yeah, Al was when the show first started. And I have said I just hope it happens for him. I just think it would be 
uh, a really great idea. Also based on the fact that we have the most amazing fans and I've had the greatest time talking with you all because it rubs off. We enjoy the fact we've enjoyed the show. And even though it was a long time ago, it's been 20 years since we stopped making it. Right. You know, obviously there's still a lot of affection uh, for the show. Um, and, and the fact that we, that folks like you and we get to share it and, and share this time together. So, um, we'll keep our fingers crossed for Faustino and, uh, and hopefully you'll call me back sometime and we can chat some more. Oh, great. Do you have anything that you want to shout out that you're working on or you want to promote while you're here? Well, I'm going back to New York, actually, and I hope to see my friend David Garrison when I'm there, there as I often do. Um, will, I'm going to be will, directing will some you, more theater. Will you tell mm-hmm. him hi for me? I sure will. <laughs> I sure will, Jerry. And um, uh, and actually, I'm going to be, so you guys can plan your trip. Ted McGilley has just started going to these conventions, and he and I are going to appear together at the Rhode Island Comic Con in November. And I haven't seen Ted in years. He and I were wow. neighbors, not next door, but we lived in the same uh, little burb in um, outside of La- in Los Angeles uh, when I was still living there. And uh, but it's been some time since I've seen him, so I'm really looking forward to that. So come and see us. Um, I teach full time at uh, the Seattle Film Institute where I live. I teach. I run their acting program, and I also teach multi camera production, but I continue to work. I'll be going back to New York to work on another uh, theatrical piece headed to off-Broadway, fingers crossed. And okay. um, and then I continue to, um, I'm in development on a feature film. I have yet to direct my first feature, but Whoa. never say never. Yeah, if you, if you do, if you get to direct a feature film and you do any kind of crowdfunding, please let us know and come back and let us help you with that because we would love to to support you in everything you're doing well thank you what a generous offer i appreciate that and yeah i'll keep you posted come see me in the fall i think it's like the second weekend in november rhode island comic-con okay absolutely sounds great and thanks again this was such a great time no ma'am we'll be right back to wrap up this week's review Be sure to join their Facebook group page for all the podcast news and updates. Just type in www.facebook.com slash groups slash Married with Children podcast. Be sure to subscribe to them on iTunes and please leave a review telling them what you think of the show. To subscribe to their YouTube channel, just go to channels and search up Married with Children podcast. You can email them at marriedwchildrenpodcast.com at gmail.com that was just amazing uh i cannot believe marcy rhodes darcy was on our podcast it blows me away i think uh a celebratory shot is due i think you're correct i agree yeah we are in the nudie bar uh for life or at least for four and a half more years but uh we got our no ma'am shirts on and let's do a shot to Marcy Rhodes at this point of our show, but Marcy Rhodes, Darcy, all together. Amanda Burst, thank you for coming on the show. Here's to you. Cheers. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! What'd y'all take a shot of, by the way? Vodka. <laughs> uh, bird dog whiskey. I did crack and rum. <sighs> mm. I'd rather have it either of those two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of the most surreal moments. First of all, I just, as soon as I heard her voice, I was like, she's such a pleasant, she has such a pleasant voice. Like, and she sound, it's, I didn't really, and it wasn't until after the interview that uh, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be watching her on DVD, you know, eat on my TV each week. Like, I just <laughs> talked to her. She's going to be on my TV every week. It, it's a, it's a weird feeling, but it didn't happen until after the interview that I really kind of put that in perspective. It's almost like we could never see her the same way again. Yeah. It's amazing to get such insight into the show because she has a lot of background information uh, just about how the show was running, how it was made, because uh, she got to direct so many episodes. So it was it's 
like now when I watch it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be even more appreciative of her as an actress, but just in general of how the show is made. I think that you're just jealous that she got to kiss Steve. I am jealous that she got to kiss Steve. I'm gonna. I need Steve. I need to get Steve on here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Someone give me his number. Uh, you know what I was hoping she would say? I thought that she's that she was gonna say, "Well, when I when I see Steve in New York, I'll I'll tell him about your show. Maybe he'll come on." I was dying for her to say that. I wonder if I should text her that. You should ask her, dude. That's actually what I was hoping because I was gonna be like, "Hey, that's why I said, hey." tell steve we said hi right and i was i was our well that i said hi be, like because one i'm the steve fan and two i was hoping you know because even if she she yeah and, and she might still she might tell him about this show and he might you know go yeah get, let me get in touch i want to talk to jerry i i said in my delusion <laughs> that, that's what he would say i want to talk to jerry <laughs> and i i think she did have a good time i think um just in general like it went so smoothly. She mm. seemed to really love talking about marriage with children and talking about the background aspects and all that. And she didn't shy away from anything. Like, like you asked her about the Ed O'Neill thing, yeah. and she was she was pretty upfront about it and respectful about it. Um, I yeah. asked her about coming out, and she got to tell her side of it, and that was wonderful. So yeah, that was really good. Yeah, I'm on a high right now. Like. Not for that shot either. I'm talking about because this interview. <laughs> yeah. I'm on a high. I mean, this is you know I've interviewed people don't know me on this show really, but I'm. It's not like my first rodeo. I mean, but uh, I, I've interviewed like 40 people already. But you know, there's just something special about um, someone who God. I mean, I know Justin can't relate because his unique amazing aspect to our show is that he's new to all this so i mean uh like if you have a favorite like what do you have like a, what's your favorite tv show that you watch like if you had a comparison uh to the me? wonder years is my favorite show of all time all right so it's like you know interviewing the that you know arnold's sister or winnie cooper or something you know it's well, yeah like uh danica mckeller i believe her name is yeah that would be rough <laughs> yeah right hmm. So that always affects me differently. I mean, this is just amazing. Mm -hmm. What an honor. God. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm so glad we started this show. And look what it's already leading to six months into it, man. Whew. Killing it. Yeah. Once again, thank you, Amanda Burse. Uh, you are awesome. Thanks so much for hopping on. And hopefully, uh, I, I think I will muster up the guts to go ahead. And, uh, you know, I just wrote to her, by the way, and I said, hey, listen, thanks. That was amazing. We love you so much. And, uh, never forget it thanks so much for coming on and uh she said uh thanks or, or something and but the important thing she said was keep in touch so yes because you know what i thought and i don't i i didn't say it during the interview because i didn't know how it go but i actually really wanted to be like would you ever be interested in coming on and reviewing an episode of married with children with us could you imagine that like that would be interesting <laughs> like but, yeah. I, don't I don't know. She, she had a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that's it for this show. We hope you enjoyed. Special treat. I know you're not going to complain about missing uh, the review you thought you were going to hear, which is how do you spell revenge, guys? That will be the next show. Uh, it's an amazing one, but definitely worth the wait because you got this instead. <laughs> and, uh, guys, uh, I think we should just go get under the table drunk here because uh, it's time to celebrate this. More shots.